Today, all the peoples of the world are moving into the same world, a world created by the accelerated technology of the 20th century, a world shaped by the people and events of that time, our time. In the 20th century, we reached for the moon and developed a technology to grasp it. We traveled backward in time and saw what our own planet looked like in its primordial beginnings. Although we may travel in space and visit the moon, the Earth is still our home because it's unique, the only accessible planet that can sustain our life. This film is an effort to an understanding of the environmental crisis and its possible cure. We are looking at our Earth. The thin red line running along the outer perimeter is our biosphere. As seen from space, it is the smallest veil of cover, imperceivable and delicate, the only known place in our solar system that can sustain life for man. We cannot exist more than a few thousand feet above our Earth, nor can we yet live beneath our oceans and soil. Most of us exist near sea level. The inescapable fact is that man can exist only in his biosphere. The author of numerous books, Barbara Ward, is Albert Schweitzer Professor of International Economic Development at Columbia University. It is possibly the beginning of an era in which uh, uh, this vision of the planet that you see from the moon a single, alone, full of light, full of life, and the only single planet that's got these qualities, that that vision, especially among the young, can mean a redirection of how people think about this problem. Because you will not create a community unless you've got some moral commitment. And moral commitment needs some very stern underpinnings because we ain't moral easy. Now, it seems to me that the biosphere in which we share a climate, we share system, we share ocean, and we cannot escape it, could be the physical, scientific, and technical underpinning of a moral community, because we tend to be moral when we have no further choice. One of the world's great women, a foremost anthropologist and a great humanist, Dr. Margaret Mead explains her views. The air we breathe is indivisible. And this is something that we all share and is impossible for any group of people, any individual, any country to possess. The basic cause of the problem is people. As the population of the world rapidly increases, there is greater demand on the Earth's basic resources of land, water, and air. This planet's capacity to give sustenance and to absorb and recycle waste is not boundless. And in the next 25 years, the Earth's population will increase more than it has in the last million years. And to the nations of the world, this poses a greater threat than anything we have experienced before. People on every continent, all facing disaster if we don't find a solution for the population explosion that now threatens the world. Because man, like all creatures, needs and depends upon the oxygen, the water, the food that is provided by the self-balancing tendency of nature. And this is being threatened by the technology that makes civilization possible. By our interfering with natural processes, we are destroying the natural environment upon which we all depend. If we do not now take action, drastic action, and develop the wisdom to maintain an environment which is basic to all life, the only answer can be disaster. President Nixon and the United States Congress established the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future. The chairman of this unique commission is John D. Rockefeller III. It was a very broad-ranging mandate. Nobody's had one uh, of this character before. And just from that, this question of quality of life just emerged as the seemingly key issue. 
But the main finding was that stabilization of some kind is, is clearly uh, desirable for the country. Yes, we, we said that it is recognized that population cannot continue to grow indefinitely. Nobody questions that. And we said from our findings, we felt that now the nation should welcome and plan for a stabilized population. Well, the whole question of pollution, environment, and population came very much to the fore in amazingly rapid time. And President Nixon, in July 1969, made a statement to the Congress exclusively on this question. And I'd like to read just two sentences from that statement, as I think it's indicative of his concern in regard to the subject and his recognition of its importance uh, here and around the world. He said, one of the most serious challenges to human destiny in the last third of this century will be the growth of the population. Whether man's response to this challenge will be a cause for pride or for despair in the year 2000 will depend very much on what we do today. This commission, at the urgent request of President Nixon, and after two years of studying the problem, recommended that laws prohibiting abortion be liberalized, that government funds be made available to cover abortion services, and that abortion be covered in health insurance. Families are encouraged to have two children, and it is suggested that sex education be widely available. The Population Commission also urges that individual states encourage teenagers to receive contraceptive services and hospitals relax policies concerning voluntary sterility and make it easier to obtain. The Population Commission never advocated abortion as a means to control population. The Commission's report has now been rejected. I do think, to begin with, governments often appoint commissions so they won't have to deal with the problem. No city is a greater example of the depersonalization of the human being than New York City. New York City has become practically ungovernable with almost weekly breakdowns and strikes disrupting all services to the city. This once shiny golden door to a vital nation has become a cesspool of crime, overburdening welfare and racial strife. New York is a product of a population out of control, unhealthy, and unstable. The population issue was discussed in depth with the ambassador from Japan to the United Nations, Mr. Moto Ogiso. Japan was also one of the first nations, to my mind, that uh, moved toward a stabilized uh, population level. How, how do you account for that? I think uh, it was brought about by the a uh, sort of spontaneous or uh, voluntary recognition by the people of the importance of population control. It was not urged particularly uh, by the government, but uh, the people themselves understood that without the appropriate population control, they would not be able to achieve the higher standard of living. In my personal opinion, that was the main cause for the success of uh, population control in Japan. Chairman of the Preparatory Committee for the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment is the Jamaican representative, Ambassador Keith Johnson. In my view, we have a, a first-rate family planning program supported by a government. And in the past decade, I have watched a decrease in the natural increase in Jamaica and in the birth rate in Jamaica. In this whole population question, I think we have to talk first about balance. That we want to balance the population, the people that are here at any one time, with the resources at any one time. And we know at the moment we don't have the resources. We don't have the teachers to teach them. We don't have the doctors to care for them. We don't have enough older people to care for them because the older people are still dying the children we've been saving. And in countries like the United States and Northern Europe, we each child at present is responsible for using so much energy and producing so much pollution that this is a danger too. 
A prominent geoastronomer, Dr. Walter Orr Roberts, is president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Well, I think, I think we need to, first of all, recognize that there is probably somewhere a limit to the population, but that we don't know what that limit is. And I do think that in parallel with the study of what the true limits are to, to population growth, that, that, that are ultimate limits for mankind, we should put a great deal of effort onto just what you have said, the better life with less waste, better life with less energy, better life with less transportation, better life for the human being, almost certainly urban, but with opportunities to get out into nature more easily than now, just the better life, and it can be done. There are places where the concentration of population is so dense, is so terrible, that no one has a decent life now, even if they aren't industrialized, and if they are industrialized, it makes it a thousand times worse. Dr. Harrison Brown is professor of geochemistry and of science and government at the California Institute of Technology. He is Foreign Secretary of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. There are several population problems. And the most obvious one, of course, is that uh, uh, there are so very many people. And that uh, the numbers of people are growing so rapidly. But superimposed upon that, uh, there would be population problems in these countries, even were the population itself not growing. Uh, this results from the fact that um, people are moving so very rapidly uh, from the uh, land into the cities. We have a population that, because of the way it's distributed, and because of the strain on the use of power and the use of pesticides and insecticides and all these things, a population that is endangering life in this whole planet, and one is part of the other. Furthermore, the uh, enormous population increase, an increase that we're powerless to stem immediately, because we're undoubtedly going on to something like seven billion people. Obviously, this is no moment to increase population. In fact, it's a moment to postpone the increase. And I think if we can think about the unborn children, who will be our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, we have an obligation to them that they should not be born in a moment when their chances of the good life are so poor. We should postpone their birth until we've got this problem in hand, until we are making this planet safer for people. Urbanization is taking place in these areas with frightening rapidity. People are moving into cities faster than uh, city services can be provided, such as housing, sewage, transportation. And as a result of this, you find there's a common phenomenon in virtually all of the developing countries, in virtually all of the poor countries, the, the rise of the vast slum areas, the variados of Lima, or the Bastides of, of Calcutta, the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, uh, they, they have different names, but it's basically uh, the same uh, phenomenon. Vast uh, slum areas growing uh, out, out of control. Related to that is still another uh, uh, problem, and that is that people are pouring into the cities more rapidly than jobs can be provided. So you have vast unemployment in these areas. And when you have vast unemployment, crowded conditions, uh, conditions of deprivation and poverty, you then have unrest, uh, you basically are creating conditions of instability.
it is terribly important that these areas uh, develop more rapidly than they are developing now so that jobs can be provided, uh, so that more food can be grown to relieve hunger, so that more facilities for education, for public health uh, can be created, so that death rates can be lowered and human happiness can be increased. And we have to recognize also that the industrialized countries must balance their population as vigorously or more vigorously than they ask any other part of the world to do. Because we may not be as poor. We may be able to feed our populations on beautifully packaged food that's been very carefully set up and is using tremendous amounts of polluting material to bring that food into our homes. This population increase is endangering the quality of life everywhere. We can take less good care of our children. We don't know how we're going to build houses for enough of them. When you realize that we have to build as many new dwelling units as have ever been built in the history of man, if we're going to house the people that live here now properly. Dr. René Dubose. The eminent microbiologist is recognized as one of the world's foremost scientific humanists and a Pulitzer Prize winner. At the present time, the population in this country and in Europe is increasing at the rate of about 1% a year, whereas the consumption of electric power and the consumption of uh, resources is increasing at the rate of 6% a year. So that even if we were to stop population growth, we are not going to solve our problems unless we do something about the technological enterprise. So first, let me make clear that I, control of the technological enterprise is just as important as control of population. But after saying this much, I also believe that unless we control population, we won't solve our problem. So in this generation, now, we should invite fewer people to be born. Quality of life, especially for the elderly, has reached the lowest point in modern time. With ever higher and higher living and medical cost, the once bright promise of a golden age in life has become instead time of despair, hopelessness, and resignation. We are constantly adding tremendous quantities of discarded material into our biosphere. Whether they affect us as refuse, polluted air, or chemicals poured into our waters, they leave a lasting testament of death. Vastly greater quantities of materials are poured into the atmosphere, poured into streams, and so forth. What, what goes into a system has to go out of the system in the form of uh, refuse, uh, in, the, in the form of, of pollution. I question that we will killed by, be killed by pollution. Man is immensely adaptable. After all, there has never been a more 
polluted environment than the industrial areas of northern Europe a century ago at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There is nothing in our time which is as polluted as this was. And men have survived. Men survive in the most terrible situations with very little food. So it's, the question is not destruction. The question is whether it is worth surviving under these conditions. What we're worrying about is what's going to happen to the atmosphere all around our Earth, and it's going to hit you wherever you are, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, just as much as it will hit the principal polluters in the world. For the first time in the history of mankind, we have, during the past 50 years, introduced a variety of substances with which nature has had no experience in the past so that nature does not know how to deal with them. And when we speak of a system of pesticides, for example, what we really mean is that this is a kind of pesticide for which there is nothing in nature to destroy them. And that's a, perhaps the largest single problem that we face today. In the controversy between population numbers and, and technological residues, which is the more crucial issue, the population or the pollution? I think that's the wrong question. And I think we should add war. We should add all the consequences of scientific warfare today with radioactivity and the destruction of territory that goes on in a modern war. And we should face the fact that it's modern types of warfare, the population explosion, and the endangered planet in terms of the kinds of pollution that we're giving it, all together that are producing the crisis. Environmental problems of the atmosphere are very intimately connected to weather forecasting and to weather research. The very same techniques that allow us to assess the distribution of rainfall, cloud cover, and so on, are involved in assessing the fate of atmospheric pollutants, where they'll drift to, uh, what the chemical reactions will be that occur, and in fact, what the impact of man's activity will be on the weather itself. Uh, and I suspect that one of the very most important studies of the next two or three decades will be the study of what the added heat pollution, the added dust burden to the atmosphere by man's activities, what that actually does or will do to the climate. Uh, so it's very much the same problem. We are looking at an electronic picture created by one of the world's most advanced computers at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. Leading scientists believe that the computer may be the key to a new era in global weather forecasting, revealing to us the secrets of the atmosphere and aiding mankind with a two to three week accurate forecast of the weather throughout the whole world. The benefits from such knowledge in the fields of agriculture, transportation, and recreation are enormous. The central fact in the consumption patterns of modern man is combustion. A very large part of our individual mobility and entertainment is tied up with the internal combustion engine. The pride, the joy, the workhorse of modern man, his car. In the United States, there is now virtually one automobile for every second citizen. We are, in fact, new species, half man, half automobile. And it is the heavy breathing of our motorized half that poisons the air, destroys the lungs, and creates smog city. Yet cars are clearly the most popular of all consumer durables. They appear in the wake of affluence as man's first technological love. They will not be easily eliminated. An enormous part of our increased demand for more and more energy is satisfied through the burning of fossil fuels. The major problem is with coal. Electricity generation is expected to triple by 1990. Coal will still be providing at least half of this 
vastly increased flow. It is plentiful, although to get it, many countries will pay a terrible environmental price in scarred and abandoned landscapes. The air in Tokyo is so poisoned that special exercises are given to increase respiratory capabilities. These children are performing a daily practice that will hopefully strengthen their lungs. Japan is not alone with its contaminated air. On the other side of the world, in the very center of affluence, similar breathing drills are held on the rooftops of New York City. Research is accelerating on the effects, especially among the young, of our poisoned air. Bronchial diseases among children are rising at an alarming rate. Vending machines dispensing oxygen have become an accepted fact of life in the Orient. In laboratories, animals subjected to the same mixture of air found in major cities throughout the world have died in a few days. These deadly conditions, once found exclusively in the developed world, are now in the emerging nations. The errors of the Industrial Revolution are now being inflicted on nations most anxious for development. The question is how to balance development and safeguard the environment. We haven't got the kinds of problems, necessarily, that the developed countries now experience. But we have our own set of problems Ms. Ward, how do, how do developed nations properly address themselves to developing nations who have the desire and the right to develop in cautioning them about harming the environment or adding to the numbers of people? Uh, I would suggest that the way in which developed nations can make any kind of case for environmental care for the whole of this planet which we share is by giving an example themselves. We're talking about industrial development. This is fine. We are being told of the problems inherent in industrial development insofar as the environmental imbalance is concerned. What we have to learn to do is to make it clear to people whether they belong to rich countries or to developing countries that whatever happens to our environment in the way of pollution or resources will affect their individual lives, and more importantly, the life of their children. As we have built up to the conference, developing countries have come to see more and more how they can benefit from the conference, as long as this, develop, as, as long as this program is not likely to inhibit our development. The developing nations don't have to have the dreadful cities that we've got in the developed world. They do not have to have megalopolises of six to ten to twenty million people. If you begin now with a sensible concept of an urban grid with, with poles of growth in various parts of the developing countries, you can have cities of half a million to a million as your centers of population. You can have the smaller cities serving the new agricultural markets and you can, as it were, disperse your population so that you don't have, well, you know what we call Boston, uh, Boston to Washington. Yes. Boswash, isn't it? Boswash, I mean, that's you, know, right. you can avoid this because the developing nations are not dug in to stone and concrete and iron and steel the way we are. Now, I don't think we should talk about countries as growing. Countries aren't single organisms. And if we talk about their growing, we are saying, in effect, that if they finally reach maturity, the next thing they will do is to be senescent, senile, and dead. At the present time, there are 130 some odd nations, each of which likes to consider itself as sovereign, each of which likes to think that it can do anything it pleases. We now know that we are uh, locked together in many ways. We inhabit this single planet together, and with the high levels of technology, we are beginning to interfere with each other. I mean, it's inconceivable 
for any Western democracy to subsist even for 10 years more if we didn't have, through progressive taxation, a steady transfer of resources from rich people to poor. Well, I consider that we can begin to talk about the world environment and about safeguarding our planet when we, the rich nations, are giving in perfectly formal, institutionalized tax assistance. Oh, at least 1% of our gross national product in development capital for the poorer nations, I would go higher myself. You see. We've got to stop lecturing them while we sit back and in growth, 80% of the world's income for 20% of the world's people. And that, I think, is the critical thing on this development environment issue. The developed countries have come to realize that um, we must have this development regardless. And that we can have it on a planned and on an intelligent basis using some of the experiences of the developed countries. They have the technology. We need it. Japan is uh, trying to explain the ex uh, experience we had in our industrial development. We concentrated our effort to increase the production. We haven't paid too much attention to the environmental problem. So Japan is now suffering pollution and contamination problems. And if the developing nations understand those possible problems, they might be able to avoid to repeat the same experience which we had. What worries me is that so great is the shortage of capital, so obstructed are the means of development, that they won't even be able to learn from our mistakes. That, is the, that would be the ultimate tragedy. I mean, for us to go and make the mistakes and then no one to learn from them. That really would be a cosmic bad joke, wouldn't it? A substantial part of the flow of funds and materials and so forth from the rich countries to the poor today is in the form of weaponry, in the form of military assistance. And that doesn't count. Yet we, we, we call it foreign aid. Uh, we in the United States do it. Soviet Union does it. The United Kingdom does it. France does it. We must have this development. We must have industrial development. We can't stop these. But we do want to protect the environment. Secretary General of the Conference on the Human Environment and Under Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Maurice Strong. What does one say to an underdeveloped country that is more concerned about its development than perhaps the pollution that would result from it? Well, developing countries in their response are really the same as we are. Uh, they, uh, for many years, when we ever we have had to make a choice between the acceptance of uh, uh, a bit of pollution uh, and the provision of industry that would uh, bring economic benefits and jobs to our communities, m most of uh, uh, the industrialized world has always made and continues to make a choice in favor of industry. Now, uh, when you're faced with providing, as the developing countries are, the very basic necessities of life for their people, uh, shelter, food, uh, most rudimentary kinds of health care and educational services, it's quite understandable that their preoccupation is with the provision of the uh, economic uh, resources that will do this. What do you say to a poor nation that has the desire and the right to develop? A nation that might not be so cautious about pollution. Well, I say to a poor country, I understand it perfectly. I mean, you're trying to get the very rudiments of life. You're trying to get water into a village. You're trying to get electric light into places where there's never been light before. And this means a tremendous amount to you. And I understand perfectly that if you think this issue is an issue about pollution, just as such, you know, that you may pollute a river or you may um, deforest some of your hills, or you may destroy some of your land in some way or other. If you think this is a temporary local issue and see it as a barrier to a better life for all your people, of course you're against it. And you think of it as something for the rich countries, but it isn't temporary and it isn't local. Many marine biologists feel that the oceans are the most immediately threatened part of the biosphere. 
One-fifth of the entire quantity of protein consumed by mankind comes from the sea. Only the fact that so much of our planet is composed of water makes it habitable. It was in the oceans, after the downpour of the early rains, that life first began to stir. It was from the oceans that plants and animals emerged to colonize the land surface of the planet. It is the oceans which provide the water vapor which, drawn up by the sun, falls upon the earth in harvest-bringing, life-sustaining rain. The oceans are the coolants of the tropics, the bringers of warm currents to cold regions, the universal moderators of temperature throughout the globe. The oceans are our major provider of oxygen. Yet we still appear to be under the ancient concept of an endless ocean. What's happening to the ocean in the middle of the ocean doesn't belong only to the industrialized countries because if we find that we have dangerous, desperate, toxic pollution in the bottom of the ocean, that's going to affect all of us. Because we are relatively unpolluted, we prefer to be able to stay on relatively unpolluted. And one of the means in achieving this is to take a, a direct interest in the whole question of the environment, because we can't live in isolation. And the environmental problems are all around us. The waters are bringing these environmental problems to us. We couldn't hope, really, for people everywhere in the world to understand what's happening. When they're so concerned with feeding their own people, or so concerned with the kind of localized pollution that we have in Europe and the United States. We all tend to feel that once a polluted river empties into the open sea, once we conduct city sewer systems far enough away from the land, all waste will disappear into space beyond the horizon as if we could pipe it away from our planet. The thoughtless disregard we have for our waters is graphically demonstrated by this slaughterhouse. The river runs blood red for several miles downstream from the butchery. Visceral parts are dumped directly into these waters. In spite of a great body of protest, nothing to correct it has been done. Rivers bring down the runoff from fertilizer. Pesticides are carried out to the ocean. All discharge dumped or channeled into the sea from the very dawn of time until this moment has accumulated in the lowest section of our biosphere. The only one with no outlet for refuse. <laughs> Treatment of raw sewage requires urgent attention. As our population spirals, increased demands are made upon our inadequate and too often careless handling of human waste. This is the shore of Southern California. Under these waters lie a threat to life in the sea. This long, barnacled sewage pipe is an extension of man's waste. It vomits forth 400 million gallons of sewage daily. Similar systems in Southern California produce a billion gallons of sewage per day, all dumped into the once beautiful and blue Pacific. The oceans of the world have become a global sink, a vast septic tank. Man uses the whole ocean as a receptacle for unwanted material and waste. We do not know how much they can stand. In coastal areas, we can see and smell a clear and present danger. The British taxpayer has some idea of how many millions he had to pay to clean up after the Torrey Canyon disaster. These waters carry a disease that affects one person out of every 15 in the world. Bilharzia is caused by a trematode parasite of the human body. All too often, the eggs reach a river or body of water inhabited by snails. It 
Here they invade the snail's tissue. Inside the snail, the parasite multiplies rapidly. From the snails emerge the carrier, a minute swimming form of the parasite. Every one parasite produces tens of thousands of cercaria, and each cercaria can infect the human body. In the water, the cercaria bore through the human skin and end up as adult worms in the veins around the walls of the intestine and bladder, and there they lay their eggs. Some of the eggs remain in the body to block and destroy vital organs. Bilharzia has now appeared in the Western Hemisphere. There is a known cure, but a symptom of the disease is lethargy and apathy. To combat Bilharzia, an entire way of life must be changed. Modern technology has been called man's salvation and at the same time man's downfall. It is only in the controlled use of technology that man can hope to survive. Those countries which have produced wealth because of strong material drives and the command of science and technology and its use for increasing of production and consumption are simply going to have to reorient some of their own growth patterns around the provision of more non-material needs. And they're going to have to understand that those parts of the world that do not enjoy the same material benefits that we do are going to have to concentrate for a good many years on the provision of the more material uh, needs of life. And, and so that these two things, I believe, are complementary. And they give us a completely new set of reasons for taking a look at the total needs of the people of this world and the total resources which we have and developing a much more cooperative attitude towards the care of and the use of the world's resources. Among the new technologies being developed for agriculture is a remarkable technique for stabilizing the earth with oil to retain moisture and to stop erosion. This oil-based mantle has dramatically changed arid desert wasteland, empty since the time of man, into productive fields of life-giving harvest. Agricultural research such as this is being carried on in laboratories throughout the world in an effort to turn the tide in man's search for additional food sources. feel that development can proceed once this technology is made available to us at a price at which we can buy. And what we do have to do is put into the hands of the, indust of the more developing countries the levers of power uh, which they can use in bettering their bargaining position with us. Uh, we've got to give them better uh, uh, access to our own technologies. We have to be certain now the technology is used for man, and that man is not made the slave of spiraling technology just for the sake of being able to make something new. We've been on a binge. We've been on a binge all over the world in the belief that technology could solve everything. technology has often been poorly controlled and often misapplied. These sheep were killed by a toxic accumulation of pesticide transported by undetermined means from an unknown location. Only the lethal results were positively identified. Our problems are soluble from a purely technological point of view. The real question that confronts us is are they soluble 
from a human point of view. What impresses me more and more is that we have lost contact with the realities of nature, with the realities of the world, because they are always interfused between us and direct perception, all those machines which in some way make our life easier, but make it easier by dissociating us from the world around us. And I think this is a very important problem in the rich countries. I suspect that the style of life that we live will be totally different from today and that General Motors will be building cities and not automobiles. of our forests and the killing of the habitat so desperately needed by countless species is a crime against nature. The rape of the earth cries out for controls to ensure that topsoil is returned, trees replanted, and damage repaired. The growing population creates a need for more cars and ever more freeway. People want to move. They want it so badly, they accept an accident rate of 50,000 deaths a year in the United States alone, which, if caused by disease or war, would create a revolution. We not only need to slow our death rate, we need to slow and finally eliminate our mounting dump heaps. Each year, the United States junks 7 million automobiles, 48 billion metal cans, 26 billion bottles, and 65 billion metal bottle cans. What would you say is the major environmental problem of, of your country, Jamaica? I should think soil erosion is a matter of primary concern to us. We have to husband the soil. We haven't got all the land space in the world. And that, that which we have, we have to seek to ensure that we take good care of it. And we have been affected by soil erosion. The very base of man's existence, the soil, has been abused by untold civilization. The soil has long been laid bare by careless builders and ignorant farmers. The land has been lost in the downhill rush of rain-driven water. The land has been stripped of its natural cover and passed through the waters to the ocean. Here, the erosion settles over the vital coral reefs and quickly smothers and kills these underwater havens of marine life. As if the loss of the soil were not enough, man has added his own waste and sewage to kill even more quickly. This reef, once so full of life, has been totally destroyed by the soil filtered down from many streams and the sewage pumped into this bay off the coast of Oahu. The only life these polluted waters can now sustain is the sludge worm, this scavenger who seems to thrive on refuse. With care and planning, this same reef would have been alive and teeming with marine life, providing the essentials of man's continued existence. People uh, very seldom are going to do things just because it's a good thing to do. There, there has to be an incentive. I personally feel that one of the most important uh, incentives that we can have is to increase the price of energy. Energy is ridiculously inexpensive uh, when it comes right down to it. And as a result, we waste it. We throw it away. We leave electric lights on. We take unnecessary trips and so forth. We are able to do that because we don't have to worry so much about the cost of energy. If the cost of energy were doubled, people would think about it more. The central lesson of the environment issue for this generation uh, is the necessity of our recognizing that we have reached a seminal point in human history, a point at which man's own interventions in the natural environment uh, are really now the principal determinants of his own future. When we reach the ultimate of power, which we have done, we can only respond by having the ultimate of community, which is a single planet. And that is where self-interest, moral interest, 
and sheer technical fact coincide. Many politicians are frightened to face their constituents with this kind of a truth. They have a fear that if they support the idea of a more equitable distribution of the world's resources and so forth, that they would not be voted back into office. What do you say to them? Well, I would say, first of all, that if you take some of the Western democracies, Canada, my own country, Britain, Holland, all the Scandinavian countries, France up to a point, all these countries have now formally agreed that by 1975 they will give 1% of gross national product in aid to development. And one reason why they're doing that is because their electorate would no longer accept the idea that you shouldn't do it. Dr. Brown, if you could address the delegates at the Stockholm conference, what would you say? I believe I would say that we are to solve the very crucial problems which are confronting mankind collectively. A higher level of cooperation, a higher, higher level of morality, a higher level of discipline will be necessary for all mankind. And I would hope that the delegates from this conference would emerge with a sufficient understanding of these problems and their seriousness to express a willingness to delegate a part of the sovereignty which they believe their nations have over these problems to an international organization, to the United Nations. Unless the people of the world uh, understand that what Stockholm is uh, asking of them is uh, really nothing less than a new sense of direction uh, for the whole human race, then it's not uh, uh, realistic to expect that the governments of the world will take the kind of decisions that will make that possible. What do you think of as the major good that could come out of the Stockholm Conference? Well, the fact that it's held at all, the fact that it is now a, a world conference, that people are coming from every country, that every government is alerted to the fact of an environmental crisis. So on the one hand, I'm enormously optimistic because I feel that there's a whole generation growing up that is tired of the more blatant forms of materialism, but is bewildered by the lack of institutional innovation and invention. And it's all very well to say, well, go ahead and innovate yourself. But you need experience and you need an actual sense of how things are organized to be able to do this kind of creative innovation. The change is happening now. And by this I mean that a very large percentage of the public, and especially the enlightened components of the establishment, have become aware of the urgency of the environmental problem. is not a simple animal. We have harnessed the power of the atom. We have reached the moon. And yet we do not seem to understand our place on Earth and the natural laws that govern us. It is in the understanding of these laws and action in concord with them that our salvation lies, the salvation of the Earth and our own salvation. There is still time. Hopeful signs are beginning to appear on the international horizon. The recent agreement signed between the United States and the Soviet Union on mutual environmental problems is a large step forward. Only through international cooperation can we hope to correct the crisis facing all mankind. Man inhabits two worlds, the natural one that preceded us by billions of years and the world we have built from our technology, using our machines and science to create an environment obedient to our purpose and direction. And now, as we enter the last stages of the 20th century, there is a spreading sense of awareness that something fundamental and irrevocable is happening to man's relations between both his worlds. 
Our new knowledge of planetary interdependence demands a reshaping of our individual loyalties. We must develop a sense of planetary community and commitment. We must make our Earth a center of rational loyalty for all mankind. Nationalistic loyalties must become secondary to our allegiance to Earth. We can only hope to survive in all our prized diversity by achieving an ultimate loyalty and devotion to our single, beautiful, vulnerable planet, the Earth. Alone in its life-supporting systems, powered by inconceivable energies mediated for us through the most delicate adjustments, is this not a precious home for all us Earthlings? Is it not worthy of our love? Does it not deserve all the courage and care of which we are capable to preserve it from degradation and destruction? Now, for the first time in the history of man, an international movement is underway. The people of the nations and the nations of the world have joined together to find the answers. This building and the world's representatives hold the solution. We have seen what we've done to bring about the destruction of our Earth. Is it not the time now to cure the disease that we ourselves have created? The answer is in our own hands, in your hands. Don't let this moment in time pass, for we may never have another, not in our lifetime, not in anyone's lifetime. <laughs>